대사관 강사 시리즈에 오신 것을 환영합니다. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, welcome to the third Embassy Speaker Series of 2014. Thank you all for joining us for today's edition of what has been an engaging and productive lecture series since it began in 2013. It is our pleasure to continue the series tonight, and I would like to welcome Ambassador Cho Hee Yong for the opening remarks and for the introduction of our speaker today. Well, good evening, uh, Mr. Don Newman and Excellencies and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, tonight uh, for this new chapter of our Embassy Speaker Series. The first, I'd like to express my deep thanks to each of you for your interest in Korea and for your full support uh, for the activities of the Embassy and of course the, the, the development of bilateral relations between our two countries. Uh, today's event is taking place in a very important time in our two countries' history. Uh, this is the first the embassy speaker series since a historic state visit of our president, uh, Park Geun-hae, to Canada just two weeks ago. And it was the first time uh, since the establishment of different ties between our two countries back in 1963 that our two leaders held back-to-back -back official visits in the same year. Uh, it is a clear sign of the deepening the mutual trust and collaboration between the leaders and ever-increasing momentum driving our vital relations forward. Together, the President uh, Park geun -hye and Prime Minister Harper were present at the historic, uh, the former the signing of free trade agreements, that uh, which will, uh, which will, of course, that uh, increase that uh, uh, the, pros the prosperity uh, for both Canadians and Koreans alike, and will help unlock the full potential of, of our bilateral relations between our two countries. We Koreans the, feel truly incredibly privileged yeah, to be Canada's first the free trade the partner in Asia and the making us uh, the hi, hi Mr. thank you very much. <laughs> making us that the key the uh, the markets for Canadian businesses in the Pacific and the anchor for Canada in the region. That every Canadian uh, I have had a chance to talk with uh, the, ha, has never hesitated uh, to show the effort support and optimism over this agreement. That without question, without question, when it comes in first in coming months, uh, it will definitely, it will definitely increase, and it will our mutual benefits, and then open new horizons for our two peoples. To further uh, discuss this uh, special new chapter uh, in our bilateral relations, uh, we are truly honored to have a special guest speaker uh, tonight. Uh, the award-winning and renowned journalist and broadcaster and author, uh, Mr. Don Newman. Well, I'm afraid, uh, frankly speaking, that uh, most of you uh, know more about him uh, than I do. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I think that I don't have to say much about him, except that uh, he is one of the most respected and renowned and the the trusted, the voices on public affairs. Uh, for more than four decades, Mr. Newman uh, chronicled Canada's major political events and interviewed uh, many of the world's the prominent uh, leaders. As senior parliamentary editor of CBC Television News, Mr. Newman was a household name, the bringing the day's most important national and international issues, the right to the Canadian Canadians' the, uh, living rooms. In recognition of his celebrated career, 
and his outst outstanding journalistic integrity, Mr. Newman was named uh, to the Order of Canada in 1999. Mr. Newman is currently the principal strategic counselor at, at Temper Scott Associates, the chairman of the Canada 2020, and a highly sought after political commentator, panel moderator, and public speaker. As such, we truly are privileged that Mr. Newman was able to take time in spite of his busy schedule yeah, to speak with us. Well, I'm sure that uh, yeah, we will all learn a lot of things yeah, from his insp inspirational uh, you know, briefing. Well, uh, thank you again yeah, for your uh, participation uh, in this speaker series. And then, without further ado, uh, welcome to the stand. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Ambassador Cho. That's certainly a very, uh, a very nice welcome. And uh, you know, I think it is probably true that uh, most of the people here know more about me than you do. <laughs> so I'm really flattered that they've come anyway, having that additional knowledge. Uh, thank you for being here. It's nice to see some familiar faces, and it's nice to see uh, some new faces, and to uh, talk a bit about uh, what there really is or has the opportunity to be a turning point in Canada-Korea relationships. But I suppose when you're in this embassy, maybe you should say Korea-Canada relationships, but either way, it really is the same thing. Uh, we are not strangers to each other, of course. We, um, I was checking back, and it appears that the first sort of known Canadians who were in Korea was back in the 1880s. And uh, it turned out they were either missionaries or veterinarians. So I can only assume that in the 1880s Canadians were interested both in saving your souls but also saving your animals. And I think that that's a kind of a nice arrangement. Um, Francis Schofield was uh, a, a participant and perhaps even more than that a leader in, the, uh, in, in opposing Japanese rule in, uh, in the early part of the, uh, first, uh, of the 20th century. And he is, I think, in fact, the ambassador was telling me, and so was Marius Grinius, who was uh, our former Canadian ambassador in, uh, in, in uh, Korea, that he is the only non-Korean to be buried in the National Cemetery in Korea. So there were Korean-Canadian uh, relations before uh, most of us think that they began, and most of us think they began in 1950. And in 1950, the Korean War was thrust upon us, and between 1950 and 1953, it turns out 26,000 Canadians served in Korea in that war, which they never really called a war, but it was a war, they called it a police action, but it was a lot more than that. It was a very angry and, and dangerous and, and a war that continues to this day because there is no peace treaty between North and South Korea. There is only an armistice that is uh, really uh, marked by one of the most prickly borders in the world, and it is marked along the 38th parallel in Korea, which was about where the two Koreas were when the war started and went on for three years. So there are 26,000 who served. There are almost 400 Canadians whose final resting place is in the United Nations Cemetery in Busan, and uh, there is a monument. I don't know. A lot of people don't see it because it's not really connected with the other monuments, but it's a very important monument, and that's to the Korean War veterans. I know you've seen it, but uh, the Korean War veterans, in, uh, and it's in here in Ottawa, in the downtown, not right in the court, but very near. And you, if you haven't seen it, you should go by it and take a look. So the war ended uh, in 1963. Canada and South Korea established diplomatic relations, and since then we've been going forward developing ties, working together, and doing it more in a bilateral way a lot of times than directly. Uh, we, did a, we do it at the UN, we do it at APEC, we do it uh, now at the OECD, uh, to which Korea, when Korea joined the Canadian, was actually the Secretary General, wasn't it? So, uh, and that was Donald Johnson, and that was in the late 90s, and now Korea is an active uh, member in that, of course. And uh, now we have uh, got 
to the point where we are going to have, once the parliaments in both countries get towards uh, doing it, we are going to have our own free trade agreement, comprehensive free trade agreement. And when it goes fully into effect, tariffs will virtually have disappeared. Over 95% of the Korean tariffs on Canadian goods will have disappeared, and more than 95% of the Canadian tariffs on Korean goods will have disappeared. And I really think, in a way, you've been uh, very generous with us, Ambassador, because Korean tariffs are average about 13% on Canadian goods, or sort of up and down, but they're 13%, and uh, Canadian tariffs on Korean goods are more like 4%. So if you take off 13% and you only take off 4 that's a real benefit. So I think that uh, Canadians are lucky to have you as our partner, have you as a generous partner, and have you as the first partner in Asia, as obviously the world is looking more and more at Asia, and the trick is now, it seems to me, to keep it looking through Canada, Korean eyes. And I think there are three things that we are going to have to do to make sure that this agreement is a success. Because, just because there's an agreement, and just because people say, well, the tariffs are going down, and there's a study published that says the, uh, the GDP of Canada will be increased by $1.3 billion, by 32%, because of increased trade with uh, Korea, and I'm sure there are figures in Korea that say the same thing, perhaps not the same percentages, but the same thing. But those things don't actually happen by signing a trade agreement. So the first thing I think we have to do is we have to convince Canadian businesses and Korean businesses that the agreement is actually here, and it can actually be used, and it not only can actually be used, it should be used. Uh, and I would put to you that that is, obviously you would think, uh, almost a non sequitur, but it isn't. That uh, there is competition between every sector in terms of different trade agreements, and Canada already has the NAFTA agreement, and it's signed the, now one with the European Union, which is getting a lot of publicity. And Korea has one with the United States with the uh, European Union, and uh, those are a lot bigger markets than Canada. And it seems to me that unless Canadian businesses are spurred on, and unless the Korean uh, business community is focusing on also doing business with Canada, all of these supposed benefits aren't necessarily going to happen. And I think what we need, and I hope that we see this develop, is a much better connection between the Canadian business community and the Korean business community, because that is what it is going to take if we are going to have a uh, business relationship that adds to the benefits of employment and wealth creation in both of our countries going forward. And I think that that is the fundamental thing that uh, has to be done. Businesses have to be made aware, and we have to really, uh, I'll be quite honest with you, I, I was disappointed because I've been kind of following this Canada-Korea thing for a long, about nine years. <laughs> I didn't follow it every minute of every nine years, or every year of every nine years, but I have been following it. And lo and behold, finally it's signed, the president comes, it's a great event, and a week later, the European deal is signed. And the European deal gets a lot of profile. And uh, I suppose you can understand why, but it does get a lot of profile, and it came right after the Korean deal, and I think that in a way, uh, it, it pushed it a little off stage, you know. We got pushed off stage by the European deal, and then we got pushed off stage, and we have, a, I think, an inkling of what could happen. I don't say it will happen, but when you see that the Canadian government decided to fly the Europeans back to Europe on an Airbus, for $330,000 uh, because they wanted to have a ceremony with the business community to highlight that uh, this deal had been signed with the Europeans, I think uh, we have to be cognizant that that is what has happened and we have to uh, not be mad that it happened, but I think we have to be aware that it happened and we have to uh, 
work away at creating the interest in the Canada-Korea deal and in creating the opportunities and telling the people about the opportunities uh, that are available. And I think from a Canadian perspective, uh, the, I mean, any, any increase in trade is good. But I think that if it is only to sell more lobsters and only to sell more raw materials, basically, which we're selling now to Korea, that the agreement will not be the success that it can be or should be. I think that Canadians have to uh, understand that there are all sorts of other opportunities and there are all sorts of uh, other products and we have to get in there and compete. And if we can't compete now, then we better find a way to compete. And if it's uh, with our cost structure or if it's with our uh, technology or whatever it is, I think that we have to expand not just the amount of trade that goes on be, that we have now, I think we have to draw in other industries. I think we have to have a 21st century economy. The Koreans are very good at this. I mean, we basically, not entirely, but we basically are kind of selling them our raw materials, and they are selling us back uh, electronics and automobiles and the kinds of things that are much more value-added. And I think that, uh, I mean, that's kind of a, for a first world country, that's a bit embarrassing almost. You know, I mean that's essentially uh, you know third world countries and colonies sell their raw materials historically anyway to first world countries who then uh, make them into goods and send them back to the colonies and and charge them the prices they want to charge them. Uh, so we we've kind of I mean we're so lucky in this country that we have so many raw materials, but uh, we kind of. Uh, are locked in this in this third world kind of economy, really, in the funny way of sending our resources overseas, and and then they get processed over there. A lot of them get used over there; they don't get sold back to us. At least we're not we've escaped that kind of uh, two way of, of the colonial system. But anyway, the the point I think is important, um, and it's really a problem for Canadians, not for Koreans, but it is a problem. Uh, is that we have to be able to develop some of these cutting-edge 21st century industries and we have to compete with the uh, Koreans. I mean, when you open up your market, you're really saying, well, we're going to take on your competition. That, that, that's what it is. And uh, they're pretty darn good at a lot of things. And I think that a lot of us like to buy Korean goods and I think that we're proud that uh, our Korean friends have done so well when you think of where they were in 1953. But I think that we want to be able to compete with them, and I think that the Koreans are telling us, come on and compete. And I think they're saying, if you compete, you'll make us better, and we want to get better too, because you know, there's a, particularly in Asia, there's a lot of people getting a lot better, uh, and we've got to be on our game as well. And so I think that uh, that's, uh, that's important for Canadians. Uh, but I think that the Korean-Canadian business community, I think the Canadian-Korean uh, interest groups like the uh, society like you read, uh, I think those people have to be always out there saying there is a free trade agreement, use it, get out there, and for goodness sake, don't just say, oh, it's a wonderful thing and aren't we nice and the president came. I think we have to really do something about the free trade agreement. Now the other things, there's two other things that I think uh, could be detrimental to the free trade agreement, and I think that we can uh, work certainly to alleviate one, and the other we can probably work a little to uh, alleviate, but uh, the other one will take a lot more luck and, and is kind of beyond us too. Uh, I think the, the Prime Minister and the President talked about a strategic partnership between Canada and Korea, or with Canada and Korea. And I think that that is important. I think uh, if we do have this strategic partnership, that everybody will understand at some point uh, that the free trade agreement is also there. But really, it is a, a, a secondary thing, but it's a way to work together and for our governments to work together. And I don't think really lately that the Canadian government has been doing its part. And I don't, really, I don't like to come 
into another country's embassy and say, my government hasn't been doing its part, but I'm going to say it because my government hasn't been doing its part. And, I mean, the, the overarching issue for Koreans is the reunification of their country. And uh, I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime. I don't know if it'll happen in the lifetime of the uh, Carlton students that are here. Uh, I hope it does, but hope doesn't make it happen. But it seems to me you should always be working on it. And uh, the Canadian ambassador to South Korea is also the Canadian ambassador to North Korea, as Mary as well knows. But since 2007, the Canadian ambassador to North Korea has not been allowed to visit the capital of North Korea. And then before you say, oh, well, those damn North Koreans, I mean, what would you expect? Uh, that's the kind of way they behave. They're not stopping the Canadian ambassador from coming. The Canadian government is stopping the Canadian ambassador from going to North Korea. And uh, it seems to me that uh, um, nobody thinks the Canadian ambassador is going to somehow create Korean unification. Uh, but it seems to me that a government that has uh, contacts in North Korea, has contacts in South Korea, and also to another ambassador, although uh, it's still an important thing, has contact, uh, contacts in China, can play a role. Maybe it's only a supporting role. Maybe it's just reinforcing the message that uh, South Koreans are telling North Koreans. But it seems to me that that's an important role to play. Plus it shows to South Koreans, well, we're serious, we're trying to play on your big issue. This is your big issue, and we're playing on it, we're doing anything we can to help, and uh, instead, we're not going at all. And the argument is, well, you know, North Korea is an awful place. And you know what? North Korea is an awful place. And in fact, it's a very unpredictable place, and because it's so unpredictable, it is a very dangerous place, and it's a dangerous place because it's unpredictable. Uh, and if it were to, in some way, resume hostilities, or even uh, resume the kind of uh, attacks that it makes on South Korean ships from time to time, or, or cross fires across the border, or tests nuclear missiles and shoots them over Japan, anything like that, that's going to create instability in the region. And instability in the region is going to hurt the Canada-Korea free trade deal. Oh, you're crazy. No, of course it is. Because one thing the businesses don't like is instability and uncertainty. And the more you get uh, things that are unstable and uncertain, the more uh, businesses are going to say, well, I made you one deal, but I don't want to invest. Or, well, I'll do a deal, but it, you know, right now people are shooting off rockets and I don't like that, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen. So I think that the more that Canada can do to help Korea with its big issue, its biggest issue, the more uh, positive, uh, I don't know what influence we can really have, but I think that the more people that are telling the North Koreans shape up uh, and uh, offering them to some degree, although it doesn't really seem to work, they seem to say yes, you offer them something to stop doing their nuclear testing, or you offer them something to uh, stop doing something else that you find offensive, and they say, uh, well, okay, that's really nice, give it to us. And once you've got it to them, and they've got everything that they can get out of it, they start doing it again. So I'm not saying that this is a panacea or a, or a cure, or anything is going to probably uh, come of it in, in any foreseeable way, but I don't, I don't know if this is true, and maybe, maybe you do, but I, I was checking on the, uh, on the internet, and they say that North Korea is in a lockdown. Have you heard that? There's a lockdown and that they don't know where uh, Kim has gone and they think he may be out of the capital and that uh, there could be a coup going on. Now, I, I don't, I mean, this is on the internet and you can read, uh, you know, that the world is flat and that uh, well, you can read just about anything you want to read. Um, but, I, but anyway, it, it does go to the point that North Korea is very unstable and uh, instability is not good for business, 
And uh, Korea, South Korea, the big issue is unification, and uh, the president has a plan that, uh, you know, there have been plans before. I'm not trying to be negative about this, Ambassador, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not overly, op may I say I'm not overly optimistic and you won't take offense? <laughs> I, I think it's a, it, it's a, good, a good plan, um, and, uh, you know, if the North Koreans had their wits about them, they'd be uh, going for it too. But to say if the North Koreans had their wits about them is sort of like saying, well, if, if uh, you know, uh, dogs could fly, they'd be birds. I mean, it's not really a thing that you know, we can hope about too much that the North Koreans have their wits about them. But I think uh, that the Canadian government should reestablish the context. It still has the relations with, with uh, North Korea, but it should reestablish the context with North Korea. And uh, Mr. Harper has been in that kind of a position before. Remember, it, it wasn't just North Korea. When he was elected, it was China as well. And he, uh, he basically said, uh, as he does with the North Koreans, well, the Chinese are kind of bad people, and they don't treat people well. And I mean, compared to the North Koreans, the Chinese seem like the world peace uh, prize winners. But, uh, but anyway, he didn't like them. He wouldn't go to the Olympics in 2006. And uh, then he realized, well, maybe uh, you know, a quarter of the world's population, you can't just say they're bad people. You have to uh, maybe engage with them a bit. And so then, of course, the Chinese said, well, uh, you may want to engage with us, but we don't want to engage with you. And the North Koreans may say the same thing. I mean, uh, and, and in, in a funny way, why would you blame them? But uh, I think sooner or later, Mr. Harper has kind of changed his position on China. He may not like them, but he's going there and he's got a visit coming. And um, I think he could do the same thing with North Korea. The other thing is that uh, there is an election about a year from now in Canada, just almost to the day, not quite, the 19th. And um, there could be a new government, there won't necessarily be, but there could be a new government. And if there is, I think we would see a different approach uh, to uh, North Korea. And I think we'd see a continuation of the current approach to South Korea, which is the right approach. And I think that that would be an improvement uh, over what we have. But even if Mr. Harper uh, continues in office, I think that if, uh, again, people tell him, and if uh, people beyond uh, the Foreign Service, which is, he doesn't seem to go to advice for the Foreign Service very often because, you know, they seem to know what's going on, so he doesn't like to ask them in case that, uh, you know, he finds something out. But, Certainly the same kind of people that are going to benefit from the free trade agreement can tell him, well look, this will help. This will help. There'll be more stability in the area. There'll be more stability so we can uh, create more profits. And more profits we have, the more happy Canadians there'll be. And the more happy Canadians there are, the more chances are you'll be re-elected. And, uh, and, uh, and the South Koreans will be more happy than they are now, and uh, even though they're happy because they have the free trade agreement, and uh, happiness will just break out all over, the, uh, if not the Korean Peninsula, at least <laughs> South Korea and Canada. So I think that that's uh, an important thing to do, and I uh, hope that uh, not only will Mr. Harper change his mind, but I think it's incumbent on all of us to uh, tell him to change his mind. Quite frankly, I mean, I think that. Uh, if you tell him long enough, he seems to, sometimes he listens. Now, the other thing, though, that is, I mean, it's still regional instability, and it's a harder thing for, for us to influence, but uh, it is really uh, all of the East Asian Sea, the South China Sea, the uh, East China Sea, there, I mean, there's no doubt about it, China... Is, change, is changing the way it views its role in the world, and is changing the, the way it wants to be influencing the world, particularly in the, uh, the near part of it, what, what they call the, uh, the first ring of islands. I think they call them the islands. It's hard to conceive of them being inner islands 
uh, I guess unless you're Chinese, because they are quite a way out, and they're out far enough that they're close enough to other countries that other countries claim them as well. But uh, when you're in Asia now, it's, and you're in a fight with the Chinese, uh, it's pretty hard to uh, fight a, a, a giant. Uh, and I think the Chinese are going to, uh, not everyone agrees, but I, so far I've been right. I've always thought of the Chinese, uh, military power always follows economic power. I mean, if you look at the, the role of history, it's military power has always followed economic power, and military power uh, is what the Chinese are uh, collecting in, the, in a big way as they collect their economic power, and they are going to be uh, the hegemon of the uh, of their area, and of course the Americans and the Japanese particularly, the, the South Koreans in, in their own way too, but the Japanese and the Americans and before, I mean, they just signed another agreement between the Chinese and the Indians, but the Indians will also, in the end, because they're historic uh, adversaries, uh, will resist. And God hope that they resisted so that there's not another real war. But uh, I, think, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, instability again between the Chinese and the Americans and the Japanese and the Koreans, the South Koreans, and and even the North Koreans. Although I mean, uh, the only thing you can say good about the North Koreans is that the Chinese have them, you know, and they have to manage them. And when you have people who are uh, threatening to fire rockets at, at your major, uh, the other major power in the world, and and you're sort of meant to be in control of them, uh, that must be a terrible job for them for the Chinese to try and manage the North Koreans. But anyway, the fact of the matter is that we are going to see instability in China, or not in China, but uh, in, in the area, and it's going to be the Chinese behind it. But you know, I mean, I, I said instability in China, and I actually think that what's going on in Hong Kong now has prevented us and saved us from seeing a Chinese move on the Spratly Islands or something, I don't know where, but on one of their flashpoints in the, in the Pacific. And I think that they would do that because the United States got diverted by Ukraine. And when the United States is diverted somewhere else, the Chinese like to make their move. And it's, you know, the, the Americans are having a hard time financing their being a superpower, and uh, so the Chinese kind of test them whenever they can, and to some degree now Putin is trying to test them wherever they can, and they're sort of like you know, boxing them on both ways. Uh, but I think that the Hong Kong demonstrations for the moment at least, uh, not that, I don't even think the Chinese are that worried about them, they, they know that they're not going to give in. And they want to really just wear out the protesters so they'll go home. And it seems that maybe that is working. But they really want to avoid, again, if they can, is the Tiananmen Square incident. But they're not going to give in. And we know they're not going to give in. And ultimately, uh, that uh, situation is going to resolve itself. So, um, but the Chinese are not going to go away in terms of the spat, the islands, all the other islands that have two names, whichever country is claiming it has its own name, but they're the same islands. And I think that that is something that uh, particularly uh, Canada talks about. In fact, Canada, in its own small way, has made adjustments to the Chinese uh, threat. The three destroyer, or the three submarines that we have, not the destroyers, the three submarines that we have. Um, traditionally, we based any submarines we had, we started in Halifax, and we ended up in Squimal with maybe one left over. But well, now the three new ones are the three we got from Britain, uh, bought from Britain. Uh, two of them are in Squimal, and one of them is in uh, Halifax. And that's a reflection of a changing priority in terms of what's going on in uh, China and in uh, 
the South China Sea particularly, mm -hmm. rather than the East China Sea, but uh, uh, both of those seas. So, uh, I think that all of the nations that have any kind of influence or interest in that area are going to have to uh, delineate their position, and the more that have the same position, or close to the same position, and the more effective that position is going to be. And I think as, a, as strategic partners, Canada and Korea, Korea and Canada, should be working on what are the strategic positions, what are the responses, and what uh, do we want to tell both the Chinese and the Americans, and to some degree the Japanese, that we think they should be doing when these circumstances flare up because they're, they're messing up our trade just as much as they're messing up their own trade and they're messing up uh, our world as much as uh, they're messing up their own world. So I think that we have uh, a, a, a role we can play there and I think uh, Canada and Korea together playing that role uh, and coordinating their efforts as much as they can. I mean, you can't have perfect coordination and there are different interests, but. I think that by working together, that that's a real opportunity now for Canada and Korea to make a contribution. And I think, uh, you know, when you think about it, going from a few veterinarians and missionaries in the 1880s to the uh, war in Korea and the devastation in Korea in the 1950s to the resurgence of Korea and then the uh, reestablishment of permanently of democracy in the early 1990s, uh, Korea has, it is sort of the, the poster child for success in, in, in the world. It, it would be a good poster child for the Chinese. I mean, there's so many differences that it, it, it uh, I guess, won't be. But when you think, you know, you started with very authoritarian rule, and then you had tried democracy and authoritarian rule, and now you moved into democracy. I mean, that's, that's really what the people in, in Hong Kong are doing, and that's really what the people in Tiananmen Square were doing. And, uh, you know, th there is a good example if uh, the uh, if the People's uh, National Liberation Committee would like to look at it, but I don't think they're going to look at it, or not in our lifetime anyway. But, um, I mean, Korea has been su such a marvelous success story. And for Canada, which is uh, not had much of that hard history that Korea's had. Not been occupied by uh, another power for from what, 1902 or so to 1945. To be able though to come on to the world stage and Korea has come on to the world stage and to work together now with the 15th and the 11th largest economy with highly skilled workforces, with highly educated people, we have a role to play. And it's not just selling stuff to each other, that's a very important uh, thing to do. But I think that uh, Korea and Canada have a, a really good opportunity to play a good role and to be an example to the rest of the world because we're different cultures, we're different nationalities, we're, uh, and if we can work together, that's the kind of thing that I think that where the future, I mean, because if the world can't work together, then it doesn't really matter if we have a free trade agreement. It might help for a few years, but it's not going to matter. So I think that uh, Canada and Korea should be putting a lot of effort into both uh, the free trade agreement and the strategic partner. So, to make the free trade agreement a success, three things, just let me tell you briefly again what they are, and then I'm going to get out of your hair. Uh, you know, first, we have to promote it in our countries, particularly I think with Canadian businessmen, and we have to try and create connections between Korean uh, businessmen and Canadian businessmen, and they will understand each other's markets and they will understand then how to penetrate them and how to grow the pie, as we say. Secondly, we have to re-engage, we being Canada, have to re-engage in North Korea to help South Korea with its principal strategic objective, and in doing that, I think it strengthens uh, confidence and ties, and uh, leads to us working more together, which leads us to the third thing, which is we are working on the broader, particularly in East Asia, I mean, maybe we'll work on the Ukraine, I don't know, it doesn't seem that that's really an area of interest to, at the moment, but uh, I think once you get working together, and once you've been uh, 
uh, provide uh, some success and solutions, who knows what you might be asked to do. So I think that at the, minute, uh, at the moment, though, we have to uh, work together on the uh, strategic problems of Asia and the uh, rise of China. And I think that uh, if we do those three things, um, the free trade agreement will take care of itself and that we will all uh, have a better world to live in and a more prosperous one as well. So thank you for your patience. I think I've talked a little too long. I'm not even terrible. You let a guy from TV get out of talking and it's, uh, <laughs> you, you never know. But thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Newman, for the inspirational talk. Um, so, if you don't mind, I'd like to call for a Q&A session mm -hmm. from our speaker, uh, from our audience. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand, and uh, we'll come to you with the mic. Steve? Uh, um, can introduce yourself. Uh, Mr. Niven, it's uh, great to see you again. And yes, we've been with each other for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Yes. My name is Young Haley, president of Canada Korean Society. Really enjoyed your talk, and no wonder you are still very much missed on uh, C CBC yeah. screen. So, you know why. And uh, before I start my comment and question, uh, I'd like to uh, first of all congratulate the His Excellency, uh, Mr. Cho, and the uh, and embassy all staff for their hard work for making a uh, presidential uh, state visit, the uh, historic state visit, most successful one. And uh, anybody who has been uh, with the Foreign Service, and we all know how hard work it is, and uh, it's a heartbreaking. And so I congratulate all of you. And in that regard also, I think amongst uh, us, uh, Ambassador and I were actually on Parliament Hill uh, uh, amongst the witnessing the historic signage of the Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement. And um, after 10 years of promoting, as a Canada-Korea Society also, we uh, took a pride, although we are not government, but uh, as a non-governmental level that we Right, our best the last 10 years, uh, really putting our program focusing CKFTA. So indeed, it was an awesome feeling uh, being right there and watching all that. So um, you mentioned um, my question. Actually, I don't want to take too much time, and then I have my very short comment. Uh, your title is the Korea and Canada: The Next 50 Years Opportunities and Challenges. We just um, kind of came the celebration of our 50th anniversary mm -hmm. last year and 60th anniversary of uh, Korean War Armistice. So it was a very, very significant between our two countries. You mentioned that the bilateral cooperation, putting really CKFTA really working and also improving bilateral relations in the global world. Uh, we all would like to do that. But also, um, the Canada uh, and the Korea. Um, this is the CKFTA as a first uh, Canadian first CKFTA agreement, a CK free uh, trade agreement uh, in Asia before Japan, before any other country. So that is a very significant in the Canadian part. And they also say that this is a gateway to go out together to Asia Pacific. So I would really like to hear your point of view uh, in the next 50 years uh, in what particular sort of a, uh, area or direction that we can all do. Uh, I, I would like to hear your comment on that. Uh, and also, although it's not the uh, free trade, uh, it relates with what you're uh, saying. Um, as a part of the Canada-Korea Society um, sort of program, and also uh, Korean Embassy uh, supporting this program. We launched a um, Canada Korea ESL Teachers to Korea, uh, e uh, Canadian ESL Teachers to Korea Alumni Network. This initiative, um, we both believe, and Mr. and I strongly believe, and this was also discussed at the head table with the president, actually, uh, President Shoda 
very keen interest on this. So we all believe that uh, the young Canadians uh, out of universities and whatnot went to Korea, experienced the real uh, Korean uh, life and their philosophy, their living, and so on. We believe they are, when they are back in Canada, they are the grassroots ambassadors. So we launched this alumni network uh, together with the embassy, and we are relaunching it uh, using more uh, dynamic uh, resources of uh, social media. And um, uh, we brought this uh, poster, and uh, Matika, which you write, Matika has uh, a little uh, website, uh, the uh, card. So if you know anybody, please take one very well. Uh, please uh, introduce anybody you know that who has been to Korea as yes, uh, teachers or who are interested in going or are about to go to connect to this network and uh, embassy and us. We will really work uh, very hard on this. So, before I go any further, thank you so much and uh, I would really uh, like to uh, hear your comment on that. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. And, uh... It's nice to see you again, too. Uh, I think groups like yours, I mean, when I talk about promoting the free trade agreement, I mean, you did a lot to promote the creation of the free trade agreement, and I would suggest to you, uh, now your work's beginning. You, know, you, you can't rest on your laurels, you had a nice time on the hill, and so forth, but now it's groups like yours and others that are uh, going to be able to promote the agreement and to draw attention to the agreement and say, no, look over here, this is the agreement. And I think that if there are groups like yours, and I know yours is very active, but there should probably be more uh, groups that haven't even been established yet that, uh, that should be active in creating the knowledge and the understanding that the agreement is there and that uh, that uh, it should be, it, it has to be used. I mean, a free trade agreement is a bit like a piece of music. You know, you, you could write, you can have Beethoven write you a sonata, but if no one puts it on the piano and plays it, so what? I mean, it's just a bunch of squiggles on the paper. Uh, well, a free trade agreement is kind of like that. If, if, if it's only used by uh, the people who are already trading, and maybe they increase their trade a bit, but I mean, there's Exponentially, there's only so much growth in, in existing trade. What you have to do is get other people trading that weren't trading before. And I think that you do that by making them aware that the agreement is there. And then you get, uh, uh, maybe there's other ways that you, you do it besides just hitting them over the head. But I think your group is actually a very good one because it raises uh, the, the uh, interest in Korean culture. It uh, gets people together. But I, I hope when now, when you're having your meetings or you're having your movie evenings or so forth, that you do, uh, if you, maybe you do it more suddenly, I don't know, you'll have to be the judge, but you say, you know, this is terrific, uh, there's a free trade agreement now, you know, isn't that nice and isn't that good? I mean, it's not just nice, it's, it's important. And now, everybody should use it and we should be telling people that they should be using it, because when they use it, they're going to be richer, and you know what? Boy, we're going to be richer too. So, I think um, I think I think that's uh, probably a, a more short-term goal than 50 years. I think, quite honestly, that the reunification of Korea um, is probably more like a 50-year goal. If I'm wrong, and I hope I am, then uh, then I'm wrong. But I think that that's a 50-year goal, year goal. I think that the the uh, the uh, I mean, uh, the situation in, in, in the East China and South China Sea is, is uh, a long-term goal, too. I don't know if it's 50 years or not. I have to confess, I don't think I'll be here for all 50 of the years. And, uh, so I'm thinking actually in a little shorter horizon, probably. But, I mean, I think those are ongoing goals. And I think that um, beyond that, uh, if, if, if together we can create more economic activity uh, in Asia and North America, which is really what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, doing things together. I think that that's a very good goal to have, and I think that uh, if we can do things that uh, influence the world to be a more peaceful place, I think that's a very good goal as well. And I think if we do those different things I've just mentioned, that'll be enough for anybody.
Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Newman. I'm uh, Jorge Umania from the Costa Rican Embassy. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, you, you were um, uh, speaking uh, like a little bit about the bilateral you know, relations between Canada and Korea, and um, it caught my attention that you said uh, that you have to, to go to uh, common points of view in order to speak the same um, with uh, China and the United States of America. Um, can you go a little bit uh, deeper in that part to say two topics that, uh, that uh, these two countries uh, need to, to, to tack the same to those other countries? In, uh, according to, of course, your point of view as an academic and stuff. Well, uh, I mean, my, my analysis would be that uh, basically the, the Chinese are stirring the pot. Uh, they want to, and I think you could say understandably probably, they want to exert more influence, particularly in their own uh, near area, and the United States, along with particularly Japan, are not keen to have the Chinese do that, and they don't mind them doing it in a sort of peaceful way as long as it's, uh, you know, there are open seas and there are, um, you know, the Straits of Malacca and those kind of things are the, are the model and not territorial waters and uh, the Chinese, remember the Americans said, well, forget it, we're not doing it. But uh, recently they, they delineated a, a fly zone where you had to report if you were flying into their airspace. And um, the Americans said, forget it, we're not going to do it. Uh, but I think, it, I think to, to keep the Americans and the Japanese on a, you know, so they think at least twice before they react to the Chinese, or to keep the Chinese from doing things that are so provocative that they have to be reacted to. I think that Korea and Canada, and other nations, I don't think, I mean, Korea and Canada alone probably can't do it, but Korea and Canada together can do more than Korea can do, or Canada can do. So I, I, I think that that's the kind of thing that uh, we can, we can uh, make effective. And I think, uh, I don't have a lot of faith in United Nations reform. I think it would be nice if there was United Nations reform, but I don't, I don't think that it's probably too likely, but I think that a, a, a forum that seemed to be, be right with possibility and now is fading quickly is the G20. Because the G20, uh, you know, the countries that are in the G20, are the ones uh, that are powerful in the United Nations now, but they're also the ones that should be more powerful in the United Nations and nobody can figure out how to do that without diminishing the others and so on and so forth. So I think that, uh, you know, for countries uh, like Canada, like Korea, actually like Japan, like Germany, ones that don't have the stature in the UN that they should have, uh, that we should be trying to use the G20 more to uh, to influence uh, events, that, that would be that would be something I'd really try uh, before I gave up on it. And uh, since the economic crisis has cooled down, uh, there's less seems to be interest in the uh, in the G20 than there used to be. I mean, when you think about it, the G20, <coughs> excuse me, in 2000 when it was when it was formed, was just a financial institution, and then. In 2008, it suddenly became, well, no, it's going to be a lot more than that. It's going to be financial, it's going to be a lot more. And uh, now it seems to be drifting back. I mean, I'm not even sure it's financial, but uh, it seems to be dealing mainly, when it does uh, do anything, with banking rules and harmonizing them and so forth. Well, I think that there could be a lot more uh, other issues that could come to the G20. I mean, Banking and the finances are terribly important. There's a lot of other things really important too, and maybe just as important or more important. So 
I think for countries that are not going to really advance up the ladder in the in the United Nations, uh, that would be a good forum for us. Thank you again for your talk. I'm Barbara Greenfeld from Export Development Canada. I'm not a nation trade expert, but uh, some people have talked to me about what they see as a growing um, sort of concentration of supply chains in Asia and between East Asia, North Asia, Southeast and South Asia. And I was wondering if you would agree um, with that assessment and uh, if so, if you think that that lends some urgency uh, to the establishment of more business ties between Canada and Korea um, so that we um, are well positioned going forward. Well, I, well, yes, I mean, I think both things are true. I mean, I think that the supply chains, I mean, now in, uh, if you think over the last 30 years or so, uh, countries that used to be the sort of uh, fundamental supply chains uh, like Japan and Korea and, and even China are now having supply chains that trail off into Vietnam and uh, Cambodia and places like that. So the, the supply chains just keep growing. Uh, that's right. I mean, the, the more that we can be involved in all of that activity, uh, the better I think it's going to be. And I think it's going to be better for, uh, quite frankly, the, the people in those countries. That, I mean, the supply chains tend I mean, it's true for Canadian businesses as it is for any other. They tend to go to low-wage countries that have pretty horrific working conditions. I mean, the, the Bangladesh clothing factory that, that uh, Joe Fresh was involved in is, is the ultimate bad example of what happens with supply chains. But I think that, um, you know, the more that we're all involved in the supply chains, the, the less likely that is going to happen, although they're always going to go to uh, places with low cost labor because that's their comparative advantage. And, you know, wh where they, it's, when Vietnam starts getting supply chains, then you'll really know it's gone a long way. But I mean, uh, and Bangladesh, but um, that, that, that's just sort of how, how it evolves. And, uh, but yeah, I think the more we're in, in there, the better. Great. Um I guess it's past dinner time for most of us, uh, so we'll have one more question from that corner there. Hello, uh, thanks again. I'm Devin Malone from the Carleton International Relations Society, so thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned about uh, engaging Canadian businesses or business people, and I was just curious how you might picture that. Uh, the Canadian government introduced the Canadian Investment Fund or Venture Capital Fund um, last year, two years ago. Um, do you see it more um, through a financial incentive, or perhaps uh, should we get business people and uh, put them on a plane and send them to Korea and vice versa? I think, I think actually the latter is, is more the way. I think that uh, uh, trade missions have always been helpful. I think that uh, they create the, the, the awareness that it's there, and there's an agreement that you can exploit, and uh, I don't know if exploit is the right word, but an agreement you can use and that it can be beneficial. And when the first one only gets two or three deals done, don't give up because it takes a little while. And then, uh, uh, but I think, yes, I mean, I, I think, I, I'm really quite concerned that, I mean, the United States is always going to be our main market. But it's, it's less our main market than it was a few years ago. Um, and, but the Europeans, it's the new shiny object. And you know, businessmen are just like anybody else. They see shiny object. Oh, profits! There, there we go. So uh, I think uh, that the more that can be done to get the eyes of people in Korea open to Canada, and the eyes of C Canadians open to Korea, the better. And I think that once it starts rolling, then I mean, at some point it'll roll along of its own momentum. But it's not. Um, I, I think it's going to need. More, I mean, the other thing, you know, uh, the TPP and Japan are going to, I assume, come along, although they look like nine-year projects too, don't they, <laughs> or more. But, but at some point, you assume they are going to come along. And by then, I hope that the Canada-Korea relationship is established, because uh, if it isn't, then there's going to be even further competition, and it's going to be actually then in the same region as Korea. So I say, get going. 
And let's, uh, you know, not waste any time, because otherwise uh, we're going to let a really, really, really good opportunity go by, both to make money, but also to have a, a, each of us have a, a, a very good partner to do other things with. And, and uh, I would hate to see that happen, that we would miss that opportunity. Thank you again. Very kind of you to yeah, All right, one more. Oh, yeah, okay. More of a call My name is Wei Young. I'm a member of Parliament from Vancouver South with the Conservative government. And I'd just like to take my hat off to um, many people in this room, Ambassador yourself and of course yourselves, who have worked so hard, including, as we know, Senator Yona Martin and Barry DeBowen and the Prime Minister and Ed Fast on making this um, possible. And certainly, um, I'd like to say, that as the gateway to the Asia Pacific in Vancouver, we are seeing amazing, amazing movement. There have been Korean companies open offices in Vancouver already. Um, so these things are going to happen. And watch out. One of the things that I like to say to everybody is that Asia moves very, very quickly. And so um, I don't have your um, view in, in the sense that it's going to take a long time. I think it's going to take a very short time. For those of you that are studying international relations or working in this area, I think we're going to see a lot of growth and development as Canada continues to take Asia seriously and move forward in striking those uh, deals and working hard on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and all of those things that I know, that we all know, that we need to do to increase trade, to open up our markets. And yes, Europe is exciting as well, but certainly for some of us and many of us, not as exciting as Asia, because Europe has been there for a long time. It's a great agreement as well. We're going to do and work very hard there, but Asia is where the growth is going to happen, and I think we all know that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your time today, Mr. Newman. Uh, thank you. And in appreciation of your time, we would like to present you with a commemorative flag. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much.